Hello.NET French. Can everyone hear me? All right. So we have some great hot air over here. So hopefully this, call, this talk will be cool enough that you cool down and it's, not, it's bearable <laughs> and you don't fall asleep. Um, so I want to talk about challenges of managing CoreFX repo. So first, what is a CoreFX repo? So I, probably most of you guys already know, it's part of .NET Core. It's basically core framework. That's what the FX stands for. Um, it's on GitHub. Uh, it's open source. And it's basically part of the whole .NET Core umbrella. Uh, what's in there is another acronym we use, BCL, base class libraries, uh, which is roughly 50 namespaces that you know from the big .NET framework. Uh, some of them are listed here, collections, IO, reflection, plenty of others. What's not included in there is things like ASP.NET Core, which is in its own repo, or actually many repos. Uh, there's no WCF entity framework. Um, and there are, of course, not namespaces which we don't include it, you know, we didn't include in, um, in .NET Core. Um, as Imo said before, .NET Core 2.0 has much more namespaces than previous versions. Uh, we didn't go full-blown because it's nearly impossible. Things like UI or system demo are very you know, involved to get really cross-platform and everywhere. So uh, who are the people behind the CoreFX repo? Um, I would call it that you know, there's kind of thing called CoreFX team, which is roughly the, uh, 12, uh, 12, 20 engineers. And their main purpose is really working on the really core BCL. Uh, on top of that, we have roughly 10 satellite teams spread out all over Microsoft. Uh, and over there, roughly 20 engineers as well chipping into that. So if you look at that on CoreFX repo from Microsoft, you're going to see roughly 40 people who are uh, really involved and who are responding, doing PRs, responding on issues and that stuff. Um, those people work as well on other stuff. So it's not only they, you know, their stuff, uh, their thing is working on CoreFX repo. They work on stuff beyond, like the full .NET framework. So servicing, new releases, bringing new shiny thingy from .NET Core to back to .NET framework. There's the .NET native UWP thing. Um, and um, one actually interesting thing that from the 10 satellite teams, uh, most of them are kind of co-located with the CoreFX team. Roughly six are really spread out everywhere in Microsoft. And if you have any experience with large companies, you probably know that um, you know, once the teams are really far apart each other, even though the company has kind of the same direction, it's not exactly right. Uh, and the team can run a little bit, you know, have slightly different priorities. So aligning those things is actually sometimes pretty challenging and you know, making sure that every team understands this is important, this is important for company for .NET Core, and anyway, it's some kind of fun involved in that. And of course, like when you think about the end-to-end, -end, the real end-to-end -end for .NET Core, there's so many more teams involved. Like for the core effects, actually, you notice that basically those are BCL, so it's just the libraries. There's no runtime, there's no JIT, so that's a separate team, uh, even though it's very, very near, uh, very nearby. There's infrastructure team that makes sure that you know, our CI is running and you know, whatever behind. There's CLI, SDK, and you know, many others. And Honestly, if you would say, like, who, who are the people who actually contribute to .NET Core, it's hard to say where to stop. Because is Visual Studio part of the .NET Core? Like, you know, without that, it would be really bad. Uh, you know, you couldn't do much. So parts of it are, which is the project system, but not entire Visual Studio, which is not focused, of course, only on .NET Core. So it's really hard to judge how many people, um, you know, how many people contribute or you know, how many people are really involved in the end-to-end uh, end in Microsoft. Now imagine this, uh, I mentioned basically 40 engineers, and if you look at it, like basically 11 teams, just the libraries. Now imagine how much more it is for the full framework. I didn't make the count, actually, I don't know. My guesstimate would be, would be 20, 30 teams all around Microsoft. And you can probably imagine how hard it is to kind of get, you know, herd the cats. Like, everyone, this is what we need to do now. This is what has to happen. So challenges with that are even above and beyond. And there's another thing called Mono that Mikaela talked about. As she said, you know, Mono loves CoreFX, and CoreFX loves Mono. Uh, we try to work closely with, well, try. We work closely with Mono. 
uh, and make sure that you know, the libraries that we actually do, uh, we make, that they can take the source code, compile them, or actually use the libraries. And we're trying to make sure that we deduplicate this old split uh, where Mono kind of had their own implementations, just to kind of save the du duplication, make sure that we can kind of focus one thing, that in one runtime or one, uh, one set of binaries on Mono versus .NET Core doesn't have like missing bug fixes and that stuff, kind of bring some sanity for developers. Ah. Just a fun fact, so you have seen this slide from Mono. Uh, and actually, I asked, asked Michaela, like, so what is this? Is this a monkey or what? And uh, she had actually a very interesting answer, and she forgot to include it in her, in her talk, so I'm going to chip in over here. So this is a monkey, and actually, monkey in Spanish is Mono, or Mono in Spanish is monkey. I didn't know that. So a little bit about me and why I want to speak about this topic. So I'm engineering manager on CoreFX team. Uh, I'm actually on the CoreFX team roughly under one year. Uh, but on the .NET team, mostly on runtime team, I'm there actually since 2005. Uh, just contacts on GitHub and, uh, and Twitter if you want to talk with me. And I have two goals uh, today in this talk. I would like to kind of give you some you know, insights what's behind the scenes, what's happening. Uh, because I believe that when we kind of are more open, more transparent, as well, like how it works inside, it helps everyone to kind of collaborate better. Uh, that, you know, you guys don't feel that we are doing things, you know, behind the closed door, or if we do, you understand that sometimes it's necessary from the reasons and things. The other actually goal that I have is, um, you know, seek feedback, seek, you know, ideas from you guys. Uh, if you've seen something similar somewhere else, or if you think that, hey, this is what you're doing is stupid, I'm here, please come talk to me after the talk. Uh, I'm more than happy to listen to any ideas, and you know, we will see. Um, I actually didn't say that my, what's my role actually on the CoreFX team. Um, so my team uh, owns some networking, security, collections, and a couple of other smaller areas. Uh, and um, I myself, I myself am uh, something like community manager. That's probably the best description. So if you go in CoreFX repo, the, the chances are if you file an issue or something that I will be one of the responders or you know, managing tags, labels, and things. Um, there's actually almost third goal, or that's even the part of the first, uh, the first goal, and it's, you know, I want to make sure that you, know, you guys as well understand that Microsoft, it's not just a large corporation, uh, but there are people behind. Uh, you know, behind the wall. Uh, the people are humans, they make mistakes, uh, they have opinions, not everything is always aligned. You know, if you have 20 people in one room, I, I think that, you know, if you pick some controversial topic, there's pretty, or not even controversial, but almost random topic, they will not always agree. But it doesn't mean that they cannot get to consensus. But that's something, that's sometimes what leaks out as well outside, and it's good to be aware of. So, what do we have here? This is a snapshot of GitHub repo on CoreFX, uh, of CoreFX GitHub repo. Uh, and it's basically comparison, you know, number of issues and number of PRs. Uh, I think the repo is up and running for roughly two years. So you can see that right now we have 1,500 or almost 1,600 active issues. Uh, and actually over here, down there, almost 7,000 closed in two years. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, and in PRs, actually pretty cool numbers as well. Uh, the 39, I'm pretty proud of that, that we don't have too many open uh, PRs. We really try to close on them as soon as possible. Uh, there was actually a time when we didn't have anything older than one month, or actually three weeks, which I was extremely proud of. Right now, it regressed a little bit because we needed to ship .NET Core 2.0, and we've asked a bunch of contributors, like, guys, yeah, you know, can you, can you hold on? You know, we really would like to stabilize this thing. You know, we're going to take it a little bit later. And we are now in the time, actually, we reopened master for the next version, and we're taking that in. If you look at it, the number of 2,000, uh, 12,000, actually, 12,000 PRs closed in two years. That's an incredible number. This is actually, like, you know, just last month, incoming 600 issues and 700 PRs. And if you look at that, my guess that the number of notifications you would get from GitHub uh, on the, only for this repo is like, like, likely like 10 k plus for one month, which is more than 300 per day. Now, imagine that every single engineer on the team would have to monitor all those. It's just impossible, right? Uh, so we don't do that. So what do we do? Um, well, actually, if we would do that, this is something that even our contributors or our top MVPs, this is actually Ben Adams, if you know him, 
uh, sad about being subscribed to CoreFX repo. It basically feels like your inbox is dust because there's just too much information. So how did we deal with this challenge? Uh, we basically try to slice the repo, the large repo, into smaller subparts so that engineers can focus only on their area. Um, and basically, it's really about making our team, our own team, productive uh, so that everyone doesn't spend like two hours or three hours a day just ramping up on or you know, reading all the notifications. And of course, if you have too many notifications, what's going to happen? You're going to miss something somewhere. So the more noise you put on people, the larger kind of error margin or you know, number of errors, you don't want that. And we don't want that. So that's why we have area labels. Uh, and we have actually tooling behind that. I think that every large repo actually creates their own GitHub issue tracking tooling because, because reasons. Um, and the tooling, what it does is basically tell us what's incoming and uh, outgoing. And it works per area. It's actually generalized that does it per query. So, and the queries have as well or semantics, which is something I miss from GitHub a lot. Um, and it allows us to overcome some of the you know, basic things. So basically, engineers, if you are owner, or each area actually label has one or two or sometimes even three owners or experts, so they get email notification and at least know like, hey, something is happening. There's a new PR or there's a new issue. You should look at it. Um, it has limitations because it doesn't tell you about replies in the area. You know, it's a, you know, you, we, I don't have user configuration. Basically, it's a tool I wrote like over two weekends or something like that. It serves its purpose, but it hits, it hits the limits. Um, and I've noticed actually similar problems are there from community. Uh, actually, David Click over here, uh, I think, is one of the authors of, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's basically a thing that whenever there's a new issue or PR in CoreFX or in, in, in a repo, it tweets it in a, in a, uh, in a Twitter feed. And a bunch of our top MVPs are actually monitoring Twitter to find out what's happening, what's new, which is almost a little bit sad. Anyway, uh, we did research, and we found out that actually there's existing similar UI, and it's called Octobox IO. And it's a great thing. Uh, it's, it was created or started by Andrew Nesbitt. Um, and it's actually an excellent tool for uh, someone who you know, contributes into multiple repos and wants to slice and dice it. Some of them are more important, some of them not. And you kind of look at multiple repos. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the capabilities that we want, which is, hey, here's a large repo. I want narrower view. Um, so we started like, talking with him, uh, you know, poking around, like, how can we improve that? And uh, actually, it turns out that this thing works totally just on top of existing uh, notifications from GitHub, which is not you know, sufficient enough uh, for our needs. Uh, and when you look at that, actually, it really is what it really is. It's an inbox. It's an email client almost, right? There's the you know, read and unread. So that's clear. Archive is basically deleted. Uh, what's the last thing? Start, which is basically important or something like that. And then you have a bunch of things. What's cool that you don't have to live in email only. So actually, I love the approach of having the option to do web UI uh, on not only email. Not everyone likes email, even though this feels emailish. And what you can then do, set the filters, like you know, click on only certain types of events, certain type of things. It's a great thing. Anyway, unfortunately, not good enough for us. So um, just information, uh, we started talking with Andrew and figure out actually our problem is a little bit more complex because we want to generate new types of uh, notifications from GitHub, something like something is new, uh, label is changed, milestone is changed for some people, and you want to kind of you know, set for which query you want to get what. For example, me as a, as a repo manager driving release, uh, I would love to have knowledge and information if someone puts something in the milestone 2.0. Actually, I want to know if something goes away from milestone 2.0, because I want to check that if some engineers make a decision like, yeah, I don't feel like uh, fixing it 2.0, kind of the double checking that was the right decision. And it was not by mistake, because again, mistakes happen and you don't want to be sorry after shipping. Uh, so interestingly, so it's basically the same tooling that I have. Uh, we're trying to, I'm actually working with two con uh, external contributors. Uh, we're actually right now architecting that stuff. If you're interested in that stuff, mm, come, chip in. We, I will be more than happy. Uh, the two people and my, me included are pretty excited about pushing it farther and creating something that's useful not only for CoreFX, not only for Microsoft repos, but 
in, you know, ideally for any large repo because any large repo management is tough. Here's an interesting thing that, you know, we have on the, uh, on the team. It's kind of triage rules. To kind of keep some sanity, uh, I call it minimal uh, triage rules um, to, um, you know, I, I hate process. Let me put it this way. Um, and whenever I have to put some process like this in place, I want to make sure that it really means something. Uh, I believe that we ended up there, uh, and if you look at those things, they should make sense uh, from the point of view. The first one, the one area label, so exactly one, not two, not zero. If it's zero, nobody's looking at that. If it's one, you have some owner kind of almost assigned to it to kind of be responsible for it. If you have two area owners, guess what? Everyone will think, or two areas, everyone will think, oh, it's the other, guy, other guy's problem. So that's something why I'm really pushing for like exactly one area. If, if it really splits, to, you know, spans the problem to pick one or you know, create meta area or something like that. But clear responsibility, how to push it farther to avoid things that we are sitting on issue or on, on something for a year without any response. Empty assignee. So, that's, so the first one is kind of targeted to us to kind of keep sanity on our side. The second one, empty assignee, I believe, is actually valuable for the community. Uh, people tend to be more in, you know, engaged and willing to go and contribute if issue is not assigned to someone. Uh, if it is, it's like, oh, you're, that person is already probably working on that. Um, so we want to make it you know, better. More welcoming. Um, up for grabs. Um, that's another great common up for grabs.net. Um, basically, it's the is the site that, does, uh, that kind of gives you hints where you can start in which repo. So up for grabs is uh, how we mark issues. We basically say like, hey, yeah, we believe that this is, you know, this is where we could uh, get contribution. I think the key value to that, actually, that I'm trying to push on the, uh, the CoreFX repo, and I think we're mostly successful, is that each issue that you market up for grabs should have like, what's the next step? What's the complexity? So the person that comes doesn't get surprised. Sometimes we are wrong. We, had actually, we have actually one contributor who was so unlucky. Uh, he picked like five or six issues which were marked like, oh, this is simple. And man, not one of them landed because it was extremely difficult. Except him, nobody else had more than one, which is interesting. He was just, I don't know, he just had a good picks. Uh, so whenever he, he went something like, oh, this is, this is the PR I want to do, I was like, realized, you know what? It's actually, this is breaking compatibility. We cannot take that. This is more complicated, sorry. I was very apologetic, you know, apologizing to him greatly. I was like, no, man, I have, I have great time. I'm learning. So that was actually an interesting experience as well. But still, like, having the complexity as some, you know, estimation and the next steps, this is where you could start. I believe that's kind of something that helps the community and to contributors, potential contributors, to really, you know, make them feel welcome and potentially jump and help. Uh, milestone. Uh, the only thing that I'm, you know, I'm saying that, uh, so the up for grabs is basically, again, targeted at community. Milestone might look like uh, something bureaucratical, but at the end of the day, it's actually primarily targeted at uh, community. Because my, the thing that I want to push as well, or I'm beyond pushing is, you know, if you set a milestone to something, it sh you should be 90%, 95% sure and that you commit to that. What does it mean? It means that we look at something like, yeah, it's probably not gonna happen, in this release, we usually have gut feel, you know, how much work we have and that stuff. Move it to future. What's going to happen if someone filed the issue and realizes and, you know, didn't explain it properly or, you know, forgot to mention and realizes, what do you mean you move it to future? I want it now. And it sparks interesting discussions. Then we can sometimes find out that, oh, we actually misunderstood how impactful the issue is on community or on people. Let us pull it into the milestone 2.0, 2.0, whatever. Uh, another thing is actually we have a uh, rule for issue type label, which is kind of, that's, the, that's internally driven. Only, basically the only big advantage is that we can re distinguish what is a new API, which is API needs work, API approved, API ready for review, API star, I would call it, and anything else. Anything else can be bug, documentation bug, test bug, test enhancement, and, and enhancement. And we have two extra rules, which are clearly targeted at basically us as Microsoft employees. Uh, and these are the things, like first, I'm telling everyone on the team, like don't be afraid to say no or close issues. If you do so, keep kind of the back door open, explain why, you know, 
and maybe you missed some reason. Maybe you make, 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 make a bit just uh, you know wrong judgment. It, you know account for it. Leave the community uh, you know option to come back and say no, you're wrong. I think that you should do it. This is it. You missed something. Uh, I think it's pretty helpful actually. It paid off many times that you know we. Um, we kind of are willing to reopen things. So basically, be, re be ready to reopen it if you made a mistake. And that's actually the next thing is don't be afraid to be wrong. Uh, people oftentimes, I'm not sure if you guys know it, and I think that everyone knows it, but I have a hunch that no one, <laughs> that people in Microsoft are often to be afraid to say something that is wrong. They will rather not answer than say something, they say something like, hey, this is not the right direction. Because they are fear, you know, they fear that there will be long discussion, they're gonna be dragged into that, or various fears. And I'm really pushing on people like, no, this, you know, don't be afraid to be wrong. Say something, again, leave the door open, that there can be more discussion. It's valuable, it kind of brings the discussion into the open, and it's not just, oh, we're sitting on an issue for a year, ignoring it, and basically, community is extremely unhappy. I mentioned APIs. Um, we are adding APIs uh, in actually .NET Core. Uh, we have roughly 100 unique APIs against uh, the full .NET framework. Example is dictionary get value or default. I think that almost everyone in the room who writes .NET, yay! Thank you, one cheer. <laughs> everyone who writes any .NET code probably wrote it in their project as an extension. So we call this you know, unique APIs are mostly kind of convenience methods, convenience APIs. Um, as, at least the, the hundred one that we added so far. It's gonna probably go higher up. And here are some of the decision tree or decision, you know, how we look at APIs. What API belongs to CoreFX and what doesn't? And just to say the, you know, mm. this is not a done deal. This is current state of thinking. Anything can change, you know, if there's feedback, if you realize we're wrong, we're willing to adjust these things as we go. But after actually a few months, that's where we landed that, you know, it took us actually a few months to get to this decision tree and kind of say it out aloud. Um, so first thing is like, you know, if it's existing BCL type, guess what? It's hard to add, you know, APIs to some types which just lives in somewhere. It has to be extension method, it's not pretty. So yeah, if it's, a, you know, if it's something that makes sense and it's in BCL, okay we will consider it. It's not a free pass. <laughs> you know, it has to come up to some bar, but you know, if, it's, if the type is not in BCL, eh, you know, let's think it through more. Um, another thing actually can trigger like, you know, let's take it into CoreFX, this API is, is it gonna be used by the CoreFX, uh, CoreFX source code itself? Uh, good example, priority queue. We are missing it for a long time, lots of excitement around that. And then we talk about like, should it belong here? Like, yeah, are we gonna open the floods? Are we gonna then pull like almost everything in? Uh, and we actually realized that, you know what, the priority queue actually might be used in networking and in this place and this place. So yeah, it's a good fit actually to put in the CoreFX because CoreFX code itself will depend on it. Um, and another challenge which always we ask like, you know, before we put anything in CoreFX, we asking like, can we put it somewhere else? Example is power collections that's actually sitting on CodePlex or somewhere which CodePlex is done uh, for a long time. Basically, every can make a copy, but there's no NuGet. Oh, there's actually a NuGet package. Someone from community, I think, did that. But there's no core effect, there's no repo uh, around that. There's no community around that. And those are great collections, great additions. We don't think that they be belong directly into the core effects because not everyone will use them, but you know, many people will find them very useful. Uh, so that's a thing that actually might be, you know, we're still discussing, I'm pushing for something like, you know, CoreFX extensions or whatever. Uh, we're actually debating should it be Microsoft on repo or not. Still those things are TBD, but that's one of the examples where we be really believe that uh, that's not something that we should take directly into CoreFX, even though it's valuable. Uh, and by the way, API approval process, if you ever try to submit an API, so first of all, what we want from uh, community is, you know, some kind of like formal API uh, process, which we have you know, documented. It's not ideal, I need to tweak it a little bit more, but uh, it's pretty decent. Um, describing like, you know, hey, here, here's why, here's my motivation, here's the pros, here's the cons, and this is how the API shape looks like. Or there are like two API shape you know, proposals, so here are the two options I would suggest. Uh, try to keep, you know, if you do that, 
keep it simple, yet informational enough. Uh, and when we have that, we have, you know, in rounds or actually every week, we have API review uh, meeting where people who actually did the API reviews internally for years or actually decade uh, are looking at the API from various angles, like does it fit the rest of the BCL? Does it, you know, is it something, something different? Where does it belong? Yes, no, and those things. Um, so we intentionally kind of try to make it slow. Not that we would delay it by only a year or something, but it's not a thing that you come, hey, I need this API, and tomorrow we're going to take it. The idea is that we want to, some things are really straightforward, but we want like the API group to look at it, and if it's you know no brainer, you know like for example the get value or default. Even though we had some discussions around it as well, there were people who didn't want to want that, uh, from the reasons because it's extremely simple to write for everyone, uh, which some of us didn't agree with, uh, and then you know, we, we took it. But anyway, we want to uh, we want to kind of slow it down, make sure that the API reviewers and community actually can chime in and you know discuss about the API. Because the thing thing is, once you add the API. Once you ship it in CoreFX, it's there forever. You're not going to be able to change it because of the breaking change. We don't like breaking changes. So, changes. What kind of changes we have? I picked a couple of ex interesting examples that I found over the last few months. Uh, first category is the performance changes. Um, Oftentimes, you know, say like, oh, I'm going to make this faster. We're well, way past the point where you can make change, which makes everything only faster or doesn't regress anything. Usually it's a trade-off. You make something faster and something slower. And it's then, you know, how do you argue what should win? Usually what we try to kind of look at is like, okay, what's the value? Which API is how much used? Uh, code complexity is actually another thing. People want to say, oh, let's improve this in link, like let this speciali specialization over this and over that, over that. And it's like, yeah, it's making it compl complex. You know, the code is like basically growing, growing. And it's like, is it really worth it? How often do you use this code path? Do we really have to optimize it that much? So it kind of comes back to like, you know, the value that it brings to customers, not just to one person who like, oh, I want to kind of super optimize this. Is it worth it? Because guess what? The code complexity is important. We're going to live with that code forever. Uh, you know, there's going to be tests. We're going to have to maintain that. Uh, it's cost over time. It's not free. Compa compatibility breaking changes are another interesting category. Uh, they're actually different types. Like you can be breaking compatibility against your previous release, which is .NET Core 1.0, 1.1, or you can be incompatible with something like .NET Framework or .NET Native in UWP or Mono. What we always ask, like you know, if we introduce so in the big .NET Framework, the upcompat is king. You know, we push .NET Framework on all the gazillion machines couple of billion, I believe. Uh, you break something, you break one or two important applications, like TurboTax, for example, before tax season. Um, what happens? You know, people are angry at you. It's whatever you change. It's not that we would break intentionally, but if you break something, it's, it's going to hurt people. And you have, to, you, know, you have to always count that whatever you do, there's some risk. Uh, we actually ran some, uh, some statistics uh, a long time ago, and every, every or 10% of changes bring in you know, unexpected side effects. Unexpected side effects are typically breaking changes. In most cases, they don't matter. Subtle things, timing, you know, whatever. But here and then, something matters. And if it breaks the right you know, use application, that's a bad press and everything. In .NET Core, we're side by side. We basically tell, like, you know, you want to upgrade, you're supposed to test against that. We don't push new versions on your machine. F so from the perspective, we have more freedom. But again, you cannot suddenly say, oh, let's break every compatibility, because that wouldn't work either. Um, because you want to be compatible with the .NET framework, with Mono. Now, if .NET Core is different, suddenly libraries cannot use that. And does it, you know, is it really valuable? Uh, so. Sometimes we have to look at value. For example, is it valuable to change null reference, um, null reference exception to argument null reference exception? Yeah, the argument null reference exception is right, but man, you know, is it worth it? You know, is it going to bring the value? Oftentimes it says no. How much time do I have? Gone? Oh, man. OK. All right. I don't get to the interesting part. Anyway, that doesn't matter. <laughs> 
So last slide, uh, this is how we look at telemetry. Uh, so we have, this is actually APIs of .NET. Uh, it's, you know, it's bad security key or something. Uh, we know about each APIs, how it's used, uh, how much it's used. And uh, this is actually almost done. So thank you. We are seeking feedback. If something was interesting to you, if you find that something uh, you're passionate about, you want to talk about, I'm here, I'm happy to discuss, I'm open to new ideas and everything. Thank you.